All right, welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for the Faculty of Education Colloquium Series. My name is Matt Rogers and I'm an assistant professor and the research coordinator here in the faculty in charge of organizing uh, this colloquium series this year. So, welcome. We'd like to begin tonight by recognizing and acknowledging that this classroom and UNB uh, are all located on unsurrendered and unceded traditional lands of the Wolstakway peoples. It is my pleasure tonight to introduce you all to my colleague, uh, Dr. Cynthia Bruce from the School of Education and the Fat Opera at Acadia University. Tonight, Dr. Bruce will discuss her work through a lecture entitled, It's All About Control, Disabled Students' Experiences of the Hidden Realities of Student Self-Advocacy. Her presentation will be about uh, 30 minutes tonight, and then we'll have some time for questions from the audience afterwards. Uh, please note that this event is being live streamed tonight, so uh, that will involve both the presentation and the question and answer period afterwards. And that's for people who wanted to make it tonight but couldn't attend for whatever reason. So just before uh, we get going, I'd like to just tell you a little bit more about uh, Dr. Bruce. So Dr. Bruce holds a PhD in Educational Studies from Acadia University in Wolfville, Nova Scotia. And as a faculty member in Acadia School of Education, she teaches courses in Disability Studies, uh, qualitative research and research design, and diversity and inclusion. Dr. Bruce brings her experience as a blind woman, a disabled student, and a disability activist to her teaching and research into the experiences of disabled university students in Nova Scotia. And now if you could all please join me in welcoming Dr. Cynthia Bruce. Thanks, uh, I'm still getting used to the Dr. Bruce part. <laughs> still seems a little strange. I just defended about uh, eight months ago. And so I'm still getting used to that. Um, I want to start first by saying thank you to Dr. Rogers for inviting me. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, and to say that you will probably notice that I'm not. Um, Caving, I suppose, to the typical academic uh, PowerPoint presentation requirement. Um, and I, <laughs> good. I, I have to say I debate this every time because it seems to be one of those academic expectations. Um, but I really decided it's not in keeping with my work. Uh, it's really not in keeping with the blind methodologies that I'm going to invite you into when I speak a little bit about the, the methodological choices that I had to make. Um, and so I just decided that I would speak and I'm going to invite you into my way of working and my way of knowing uh, and my way of doing. So uh, you'll also notice I have an earpiece in because my notes are on my computer and the screen reader will read them to me. Uh, you know, occasionally he gets ahead of me, so <laughs> when I pause, that's exactly why. Okay, so I, I think most of us who come to critical research uh, come to it with what my colleague Mike Corbett and my former professor Mike Corbett would describe as the stone in your shoe. Um, and so I want to talk to you for a minute about the stone in my shoe that led me to this research, although I didn't really understand, I think, the role that it was going to play when it happened, but it, it, it's been an experience in my post-secondary education life that has stuck with me for a really long time. Um, it wasn't what I was thinking about when I wrote my doctoral proposals in terms of getting into the program, but it, as my research evolved and as I came to focus my research around the phenomenon of student self-advocacy, I really realized the central role this had played in, in my life. So I was a master's student um, in, uh, in the United States in the early 90s. And um, you know I was pretty excited about being in school in the 90s in the States because they had just passed the Americans with Disabilities Act. And I thought, OK, this, you know, we don't have any legislation in Canada. And this goes really well for um, my expectations around accommodation. And certainly I had met with my faculty members and had really good discussions with them. And in fact, the one faculty member of whom I will uh, speak in a minute said to me when I interviewed with him, he said, you know, if we can't accommodate you, then you need to go somewhere else and I need to retire. Mm -hmm. So I thought, this is great. This is, things are looking good. Uh, and things were good for a while. And uh, we got into a situation, I think it was my 
semester, if I recall correctly, where um, we had a number, we had a couple of courses that were sort of offered to graduate and undergraduate students. Um, you know, senior undergraduate students could also take these courses, and so that was what was happening in this one particular course. And uh, the undergrad students, because they, in some respects, had more courses than we had, were finding the workload really heavy. So uh, they wanted to negotiate the workload, and the professor was really open to negotiating the workload. So we had a you know, professor-sanctioned open discussion in the classroom about what the workload would look like, how could we manage it, how could we manage the reading. Uh, so let's remember this was 1992. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no screen readers. Uh, so I was still working with recorded texts that I had to send away, you know, at the beginning of the semester, long before the beginning of the semester. In a good term, I was still operating six weeks behind, it always seemed. Um, and I would have to send two copies of every textbook to Princeton to uh, their recording for the blind class. So, um, so getting recorded texts wasn't easy. So we were, we were talking about what we were gonna do and how we were gonna handle it. And one of the grad undergraduate students said, why don't we just decide week to week what we're gonna do? And so I, you know, I spoke up because we were told this is, uh, you know, an open discussion and it was open for debate and everybody's ideas were welcome. And I, of course, as a disabled student, had been taught to be a good self-advocate, so I spoke up. And I said, well, I understand why this is desirable, but it really isn't going to work for me because I have to have enough time, I have enough notice to make sure I have recorded texts. And the response from my professor, uh, that I probably now describe, I do describe in my dissertation as probably the most damaging collision with normative expectations I've ever had, uh, was, was I was dumbfounded. So the, the professor who said if they couldn't accommodate me, he'd retire, uh, stopped and he looked at me and he said, I will not allow you to impose your disability on this class. <laughs> and so for once in my life, I was speechless. <laughs> wasn't quite sure how to, uh, and everybody else was speechless, and we just kind of went on. Um, and that really stuck with me for a long time, and I think I didn't really realize the extent to which it had influenced um, my eventual path into disability activism, which I wasn't keen on doing early in my life. Um, so it's really what led me into this research. So when I started to think, I think more formally about my dissertation and what that might look like and what I really wanted to look at specifically, I certainly knew I wanted to look at the experiences of disabled students. Um, you know, I started reading as all good doctoral students do. Um, and I learned a lot from my reading. Um, I really learned that, you know, emergent thinking about the relational nature of post-secondary disability support structures offered us some really good and new avenues to probe the links between specific disability accommodation practices and the student-faculty relationships they produce. Um, I also found, though, that studies in this area really haven't substantively considered disability as a reality that's lived and produced within those relationships. And they really haven't looked at, um, they haven't looked at how these connections, while they sometimes can be negative, can also help to structure pedagogical methods that anticipate student diversity. It was really inspired by the work of Tanya Tichkovsky, who is a disability studies scholar uh, at the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education and their social justice education uh, department. Uh, her work around access as a relational phenomenon really spurred me. And so my research really called attention to the importance of the relational elements embedded within accommodation procedures in the post-secondary environment by exploring how socio-political conventions and perceptions contribute to post-secondary constructions of particip 
I really wanted to understand more about how these relationships shape student experience around accommodation and learning. As students work to make academic arrangements, formal procedures require multiple exchanges with faculty and disability services staff. And they're obligatory often. They really have no choice but to enter into these interactions. They often draw students into conversations where they encounter varying perspectives on disability and academic support. As a result, they're exposed to a number of viewpoints related to disability in academic settings. And those standpoints can really shape their sense of themselves as either valued or marginalized members of their learning communities. The number of views that students are exposed to through these dialogues can intersect in really difficult ways with the significant individual responsibility they're expected to assume when making academic support arrangements. So disabled students are usually taught that they have to develop the knowledge and skill to discuss their disabilities and to assert their learning specific needs and rights in order to achieve academic success. Asserting their rights requires them to expend substantial effort to participate in a process that can, according to many disabled students, produce ongoing fears of rejection. The system also constitutes a highly individualized practice that is lived only by students not served through typical teaching and assessment procedures. And it reinforces faculty student power inequities that often surface when students request individual support. This is a tricky one because I, I you know, I don't ever want to say that I don't want to teach disabled students to talk about who they are as learners and what works well for them. We do, but the reality is that teaching them to do this. So yes, yeah, teaching them that they must develop skills related to self-identification or self-identifying as disabled and communicating with faculty about their disability-related needs in order to achieve success privileges deficit-focused methods. And it potentially imposes hierarchical and, and interestingly, mutually um, anxiety-producing faculty student relationships. So faculty sometimes find this anxiety producing as well. Continually focusing on individual students also allows institutions uh, to minimize their responsibility for diverse course pathways. And it places the burden of ensuring inclusive university learning on disabled students themselves. So, having said all of that and having kind of realized what the problem was being outlined in the literature, um, my study really explored how disability accommodation processes and self-advocacy specifically are understood, constructed, and experienced by disabled students and university faculty. There are critical qualitative methodology that I'll talk a little bit more about later. I aim to generate lived knowledge that might disrupt, disrupt deficit-driven constructions of disabled students, that might position faculty as viable resources for the facilitation of learning differences, and expand thinking about student-faculty relationships beyond discussions of the barriers that they potentially embody. So I learned that there was a lot in the literature about faculty 
um, and that faculty were problematically positioned as the problem. Um, and there wasn't a lot out there that was looking at what good can come from these relationships. So I situated my work in the activist academic discipline of disability studies, and this was an explicitly political decision, for sure. The intent was to work against ways of knowing and ways of doing that promote and sustain deficit-oriented and remedial responses to disability. Disability studies scholars do the vital work of exploring disability as a socio-cultural phenomenon. And they work to establish its legitimacy as a form of lived knowledge. In educational settings, then, the aim is to foster social, political, and educational transformation by increasing understanding of disability in those socio-political contexts. Academic writing aims to reveal and redress the erasure of disability from our histories and our cultures. And to situate disabled students as capable learners who are deserving of meaningful access to the general curriculum. And to expose harmful manifestations of neoliberal ableist commitments to independence and autonomy, rather than simply promoting another normative framework within which disability and education can be understood. Researchers urge all educators to reject deficit constructions of disability perpetuated by medical and psychological discourses, and to engage with the lived knowledge that disabled people bring to a more socio-politically informed perspective. So it's probably important to tell you a little bit about me and how I got from that stone in my shoe to the work that I did, because uh, it wasn't a smooth path. Uh, and we all have those uh, wonderful discussions with our faculty advisors that make us think. Um, and what I learned was that that one incident in the early 90s, was it wasn't going away. And it was really shaping. Uh, and I was one of those people who uh, was sort of thinking no good could come from these faculty relationships. And I really, faculty were the problem, which is kind of interesting since I was a faculty member. Um, I was not acknowledging that part of my identity by any stretch. but. Um, and I would have discussions with Dr. Aylward, who is my uh, supervisor, and uh, she would subtly point out every once in a while, she said, you know, you're running the risk of no good news. And I'm like, oh yeah, I am. And the reality is there was lots of good news in my post-secondary experiences, but it was overshadowed drastically by the bad news. Um, so I had to really think through methodologically how I was going to handle that because I didn't want to do research that was setting out to prove what I thought I already knew, um, which was that faculty were the major part of the problem. And so I did a couple of things. First of all, I realized I was talking a lot about faculty, so maybe I should talk with them. So I didn't originally intend to include faculty in my study. Um, and then I did a little reading around reflexivity, and I, I read um, Wanda Pillow's work around um, flexivities of discomfort, and it really made me think I have to go to the places in this research that are most uncomfortable for me. And what was most uncomfortable for me, for me was to ask the questions about what worked, to look at the good faculty relationships, faculty student relationships, and figure what we could learn from those about what's going on. Um, and so what I did was uh, a couple of things, and I hadn't found this in the literature anywhere, but I, I recruited my student participants. And so I had students who were registered with disability services because that's what allows them to access the formal process that I was looking to understand a little bit more um, and to engage with sort of the formal constructions of student self-advocacy. Uh, so I had 10 from three different universities, Acadia, Mount St. Vincent, and St. Effects. Um, 
And then what I did to recruit my faculty participants was actually to ask each student in the interview if they would be willing to share the name of a faculty member that they felt had worked really well with them. Um, and would they you know, mind if I contacted them to participate? And I certainly didn't link uh, names to, the, to any requests for participation. Um, so for me, this was the way of working against my um, obviously pervasive tendency to go to the dark side um, and to sort of get stuck in that no good news. Uh, and certainly what I learned as I was advised my happiness, certainly when you ask the good, the bad still comes falling out. You, but you get a much deeper understanding of the phenomenon. I, by, by going that direction, I learned things I never would have learned. So that was how I, how I did that. And I sort of worked against my own tendencies to try and prove um, what I thought I knew. And I got into some new, some new areas. So that was how I did that. So we conduct, I conducted interviews. I think I had 30 students and 16, I think, in the end, faculty members. I had 46 interviews in total. Um, and then I got to the analysis. And I learned really quickly that qualitative data analysis is a cited phenomenon. And to start to really think how I was going to deal with this large corpus of data um, with these recordings. And so I was looking at qualitative data analysis software. None of it's accessible. None of it works with a screen reader. And even if it did, the methods of coding are still all highly visual. And so I really had to think this through, and I, and I actually really had to do some digging. And I, um, I started to wonder about Kurzweil. So just, who knows Kurzweil? Yes. Yeah? yeah? So I started to wonder about Kurzweil because I use it you know, to read and annotate text. And I also was aware that you could uh, import MP3s you know, and, and audio files into it. So then I started to wonder, OK, well, I wonder if this annotating um, <coughs> possibility would actually work in the recordings. Uh, because it made, I was grappling with the notion of transcription um, from the perspective that for me it made no sense when my, the voice is how I connect with them. I connect with my participants auditorial, I can still remember their voices. And so it made no sense for me to transcribe into a Word document that was then going to get read to me by a horrible computer voice. Uh, it was going to remove me from my participants in a really disturbing way. Um, anyway, I couldn't find any information. So I finally called Kurzweil. I said, is this possible? I said, if, I, you know, if I'm listening along and I hit a pause button, can I annotate that? And then when I go to the annotation, it will take me right back into it. And so they tested it out. And lo and behold, I could do that. And it was an amazing way to transcribe because I could do you know, a partial transcription that had all the key information that would take me right back to the recordings when I needed to get quotes uh, or I needed just to engage with what they were saying. So that was how I did the transcription and it was incredible. Um, and then from that, that sort of partial transcription, I was able to construct profiles which helped me do the coding and the sorting. And so when I coded, I, I, my first sort of set of coding was literally about 10 codes that allowed me to sort into what they were talking about. So I had a you know, self-advocacy code, and I had an accommodation code, and I had um, a resistance code, and I had, so I had, that was what I did that. But what I learned from doing that coding was that what students and faculty were telling me was that this relational process of access um, was really bringing the students and faculty together into about one of three kinds of relationships. And they were either um, compliant, so we're all following the rules and we're getting it done, or they were resistant, or they were potentially transgressive, so that they were reciprocal uh, mutual learning relationships where faculty and students were really learning about how to facilitate um, inclusive practices. So that was sort of how I how I coded. Um, so what's important was that I relied heavily theoretically on Tanya Tchaikovsky's work around access that really conceives of access not just as something we have to seek out and secure, but as an ever-changing relational scene. 
And so that when we think about self-advocacy, self-advocacy is kind of that mechanism that launches students and faculty into that relationship. Um, and I use Fiona Kumari Campbell's work, she's a disability studies scholar and a legal scholar in Australia on ableism. Um, it's, a, it's a more well, structural reading of ableism, so it's not just about discriminatory action, but it's really thinking about the primacy of normalcy and the extent to which we as disabled students are expected to emulate normal as a sign of our success. So normal is desirable and the expectation is that we will do everything we can do uh, to appear as normal as we can and not to disrupt normal uh, routines of teaching and learning. So what did I find? Um, I found that, number one, there was 100% agreement that self-advocacy has become the cornerstone of post-secondary disability access. It's really the phenomenon that it relies on. Um, and it really propels students into a very precarious learning life. And when I was thinking about precarious, I was the precariousness, um, and, I, and I frame it that way, a la Judith Butler rather than precarity, I was thinking about it because it's all about your life or your learning life, essentially being in the hands of somebody else. It's a profoundly oppressive manifestation of ableism. It's produced and reproduced within a compensatory post-secondary post disability support system that continually invests power in um, what Rosemary Garland Thompson would call the normate, one of my favorite terms, power in the normate to make decisions about who and who will not be permitted to engage in post-secondary learning. Compensatory approaches are rooted in ableist assumptions of and preferences for normalcy. They're intended to promote remedial responses to disability in order to aid disabled students who are expected to draw effectively on supports to compensate for the disabling uh, results of their specific impairment. So again, disability is all about the individual. It's not a social problem within this framework. Decisions about appropriate strategies are generally made by non-disabled service providers. And they're typically intended to assist disabled students to attempt to for, perform according to normative expectations. This is in many ways ableism at its most powerful because it enlists disabled students themselves in the perpetuation of normative preferences. So we become agents of upholding those norms that marginalize us in the first place. So that is what students and faculty in particular were sort of telling me broadly, but how does this, this manifest, this, this precarious learning life, how do we see this? Um, I think first I saw it in many respects um, as students and faculty were describing a phenomenon about asking permission to learn. That self-advocacy was really all about asking permission to learn. Institutionally constructed self-advocacy, and importantly, that's far removed from self-advocacy as an activist endeavor. And it's all about gaining authorization for an implementation of teaching and learning modifications. However, beyond that, my study participants also showed me that the uh, protection of rights to academic support is often mediated by students knowledge of the existence of those rights so if students don't know if they have those rights then they don't access them and then it's also mediated by their willingness to claim disability status so if you don't identify and claim status you get no support 
Medical professionals and disability service providers make decisions about eligibility. And faculty are often given ultimate authority over implementation. So embedded within that process is an ever-changing social reality that sometimes empowers professors to question the legitimacy of disability, critique the necessity for and integrity of particular accommodations, and in some situations, ultimately refuse to allow requested accommodations. And sometimes that refusal comes because the accommodations are perceived to jeopardize principles of fairness for all. That's one, yeah, one of the most common. It's not fair to the other students. I know. <laughs> So the pragmatic reality then for, for students, as my study participants pointed out, is that the recognition of disability rights in the post-secondary context is unpredictably contingent on multiple factors that are typically linked to the decisions and actions of other people. So again, their learning lives are in the hands of others. Students and faculty also interestingly pointed out that procedures are rigid and restrictive. Um, and I got a lot of depth on that from faculty and just some way who said, you know, what if they need more? What if they need less? What if they need something different? But I have to follow this process. And students sometimes articulated that complying with all the procedures uh, required them to demonstrate skills such as organization, time management, and these were the very areas that had been documented in their assessments as being in legitimate need of accommodation. Students also indicated that claiming their rights was complicated by knowledge requirements, and that acquiring that knowledge was more difficult for some than others. Um, so knowledge of the process, right? You had to have a lot of procedural knowledge. And if you were a mature student, if you did not go to high school in Canada, um, if you were living in poverty, often we, they simply didn't have access to that knowledge. Students and faculty also pointed out that it requires, that the process and the system requires often an unrealistic level of self-knowledge around accommodation, the expectation that you know what you need and what works best for you in all cases. And some students pointed out, I've never been to university before. I haven't been in these classes and engaged in this way of working before, and I don't know yet. Okay. So that's all about asking permission to learn, and that's sort of the first phenomenon I observed is coming out of this as one of those kind of realities of self-advocacy. Uh, the next one was that in some ways self-advocacy as it's constructed in university settings kind of covertly works to construct what I call the good disabled student. So there was certainly evidence of a formal self-advocacy curriculum um, and we I learned that that students who had received accommodations during public school who had been connected to disability programs in other domains, like in government programs. People who had parental backing, which was often supported by other professionals. And even students who had taken credited courses in um, specialized schools for students with learning disabilities were key mechanisms for sort of teaching students the formal curriculum of self-advocacy, which is all about talking about what your disability is, talking about what your accommodations are, um, letting people know what you need and what works well for you. And all participants agreed that disabled students benefited from being able to do this. So we're not saying it's all bad. So knowing their rights, being able to talk about their disabilities and understanding them and developing the capacity to explain 
the necessity for an efficacy of specific accommodations was good. However, uh, my participants also dis um, extended discussions of these aspects and said it was also really important that you be willing and able to fight for your rights. And that came up a lot, that language, fighting for your rights, you have to be able to fight for it. And that in fact, they had to be the ones often to hold faculty to their policy and legislative obligations to accommodate. Participant stories also demonstrated the existence though of a more covert self-advocacy effort to shape particular student attributes. So this is about shaping back to disabled students, right? So they were expected to be polite. Uh, they needed to be organized. They needed to manage their time well. And they needed, to, they needed to comply with all of the rules. And one of the students said, you know, you really have to learn how to put a cherry on top of that request. So, and these are the expected behaviors that are consistent, again, with those neoliberal, ableist uh, ideals of independence and autonomy. It's what we really want students to strive for. And it's intended to assimilate these students by subtly shaping their behavior in accordance with normative standards. So it works within a model that claims to center student voice. So that's what self-advocacy claims to be all about. And it claims to empower individual learners through providing them with particular strategies. But all the while, it kind of imperceptibly draws that voice into perpetuation of ableist norms that produce and sustain those precarious learning lives that they have come to know. You know, and a number of my students said, I just have to not ask for too much. I have to ask for the minimum. And so all of those things were things that they had associated with successful negotiation of accommodations and, um, you know, with, with minimizing conflict. <laughs> in many respects. So the next manifestation was, was what I really framed as normal repercussions. Um, accommodations were discussed by both participant groups as an additional and often burdensome workload. And it situated both students and faculty precariously as they worked to manage multiple and sometimes competing demands. What was interesting about that point for me was to, um, to hear faculty talk about the ways that they really try to minimize the workload, but not being willing to have that discussion about students. The, the rationale around students was they're going to have to do this for their whole life. So they just have to learn how to do it. Um, so while they would attempt to minimize it for themselves, there was no acknowledgement that it was anything that should be taken into account with students. For some students, this was particularly difficult and they said it was a daily challenge to juggle and prioritize their academic and accommodation related tasks. A challenging circumstance created by people who didn't understand the sometimes devastating impacts of the additional labor. Um, you, these preferences for normalcy also um, surfaced, I would say, substantively, but not frequently, because for obvious reasons in a moment. Um, in the difficult circumstances produced by pervasively insufficient levels of physical access. So two of the universities where I include students are built on a hill. Um, and so there really were not. <laughs> many wheelchair users on campus, so I only got to interview uh, one or two. So accessible classrooms and faculty offices were a problem, and that came up on the, more than one campus because faculty pointed out, you know, one faculty member said, I can't have students come to my office if they're wheelchair users. And sure, I can come to them, but that's not good enough. 
And they pointed out that we're in many ways illustrative of confused institutional priorities. So it, you know, one in one way we tout diversity in our missions, uh, but we we don't expect wheelchair users in our building. Normative expectations also constituted a number of disabled participants as less capable. They felt that they were looked at as less capable and consequently less welcome in the classroom than their non-disabled peers. One student said to me, I simply don't feel like I'm welcome here. My way of learning, my way of doing isn't welcome. Their disabled bodies and ways of doing were often construed as troublesome and they were perceived to bring about the individually and systemically onerous necessity of having their individual needs met. Preferences for normal caused a lot of disabled students to seek out or highlight the parts of themselves that conformed most closely with normal. And many felt specific pressure to shape themselves into the kind of students they had learned faculty values. Essentially, those are the smart students who don't cause more work by disrupting the normal flow of teaching and learning. Um, so by now you probably decided I fell into my own trap <laughs> and, and, and I'm running the risk of no good news, right? Um, but I, I didn't. There really actually was some, some very good news and I learned a lot of really interesting things from faculty who talked about uh, and cared very deeply about their pedagogy, about their relationships with their students who believed wholly that teaching is relational and that teaching is really important for them. They made visible the strength and possibility that had been generated within those relationships that valued and understood diversity in the classroom. There were faculty participants who spoke passionately about their commitment to inclusive pedagogy and about their stalwart conviction that institutions of higher learning simply need to do better. They believed they had a significant role to play in that change. They really believed they were part of the solution and had to be by creating equitable spaces for meaningful teaching and learning to occur. The words and actions of supportive professors were profoundly meaningful for students. So when you as a faculty member do what seems very simple, like say, if there's anything else you can think of or if there's anything else you need, please contact me. You have no idea how profoundly meaningful that is for students. It seems simple and it's unbelievably helpful. And these, offer, these relationships really presented great opportunities to reconstruct, I think, our notions of who belongs in transgressive possibilities make it possible to think through what it means to make a place for disability at university. So we know that modified learning and assessment conditions can make it conceivable for disabled students to complete a university degree, but they don't necessarily open for analysis the myriad ways that formal accommodation procedures work to strengthen constitutional divisions between disability and ability, between normal and abnormal. And these relationships offered us opportunities, I think, to disrupt that. They don't offer any substantive challenge to the, subs to the status quo, essentially. So self-advocacy has become, as it's constituted in universities, a way of, of maintaining and sustaining the status quo. And they also do, our individual ways of, of uh, responding to disability do very little to center disabled ways of knowing and doing. Being truly transgressive, I think, necessitates perceiving access as a social space. And when we do that, it makes it imaginable to uh, 
think with, as Rod Michalko and other disability studies scholar would say, to think with disability rather than about disability. So we have to think about how we solve the problem that is disability. It always makes me think of sound music, how we solve the problem like Maria. Um, and, but we don't think with disability. And I think if we do that, it offers us really good opportunities to open up possibilities. Professors who were referenced and who participated in this study tangibly demonstrated the existence of this potential. I spoke with a number of faculty who have fundamentally changed their teaching practices from talking with disabled students because those disabled ways of knowing and doing allowed them to see the inequitable uh, nature of some of their practices. And they were really committed to learning about their own teaching by engaging with disabled students to gain an understanding of how their pedagogic, pedagogical practices facilitated and hindered inclusion. This kind of reciprocity suggests that it's conceivable to think through and disturb the ablest places most often created by non-disabled people sites that so regularly compel disabled students to emulate normal as a strategy for success. These relationships also made it possible to imagine the reclaiming of self-advocacy, which has been sort of ripped from its activist roots uh, that initially aimed to disrupt oppressive practices. And it makes it imaginable to think about how we as disabled students um, and faculty members, I think, might reclaim that as an anti-oppressive or anti-ableist endeavor. Students who spoke openly with faculty about how disability and course requirements intersect to create inequitable learning conditions were able to push back against university norms especially when their faculty members responded by examining and changing course elements for all students, not just for disabled learners. And they really pointed out that it's plausible for disabled students to do things, not to prove that they can, and not to pass as normal. They can do things like everyone else because they are disabled students. I think in closing, one of the things that I, I, I think that the study taught me is about the important conversations that we have to open up on our university campus. Um, you know, in times where we're starting to have important, important discussions about decolonization, um, and important discussions about how we make our campuses more welcoming for all the diverse learners who come. Um, we're still not talking about disability in any other way than how we solve that problem. And you know, one of my faculty participants said, disability is not part of our discourse. We don't talk about it. Um, we, I, I don't know what, I'm not sure what's happening here at Unity because I didn't look it up, but certainly in Nova Scotia and in many campuses across the country, we're moving to languages, to language around acceptable learning centers. Is that what's going on here? So, so what would formerly be called um, disability services is now called accessible learning services. And while I understand the motivation for doing that, it really accomplishes the very erasure of disability from our language that we're trying to work against. So students don't even know where to find. I had to look through several pages on many websites to find the word disability anywhere. Um, and whether that's what we intend or not, it sends a really strong message, an enablist message, that normal is preferred and disability is not language that we want to use. Um, so I think we have to really take seriously that we have to start having conversations about the existence of ableism on our campuses and in our educational context. Um, and yeah, so that's, um, I'm happy at this point maybe to want to move, I'm not sure what time we are, Mike. Time for questions. Time for questions. Hands up. Okay. Time for a round. Oh. <laughs>
So we probably got about 10 minutes for, for questions, and then we, we do have a, um, a reception uh, down in the faculty lounge after, so we can continue conversations down there after. Second floor, room 225. Yes. Okay. If you have a question, just speak up. Don't put your hand up. Yes, my ear's holding it up. <laughs> I've got a question for you, Cynthia. I'm Margaret Kress. Hi. I work here at UMB, and I've been studying disability for a very long time. Mm -hmm. I've been teaching it. I've been talking about critical disability theory in education. Mm -hmm. I have taught educators, students, family members, people with disabilities about the social model of disability, mm -hmm. about ableism. Mm -hmm about understandings of intersectionality between ableism, racism, sexism, and all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. And everywhere I go, it doesn't matter if it's on one side of Canada or the other, there is extreme resistance yeah. in faculties of education in particular because of the adherence to the medical model yeah. in schools that we are consistently, <laughs> we, we're up against it yeah. every day. Yeah. And as educators, um, you know, we're trying to support people with disabilities that are coming to our universities, but we're also trying to support what is seen as the non-disabled population in understanding this phenomenon of ableism. Right. And there just seems to be a great resistance to understanding the phenomenon of ableism, which is a real thing, it's not just a, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> And, and also the backlash against the discourse of normalcy. Uh, and I'm just, I just feel that um, as a critical theorist, we are having some real difficulties within our own faculties mm. because we have huge departments that are based on funding from pharmaceuticals, for example, yeah. Yeah. that are supporting ed psych. Uh, so educational psychology, educational counseling, special education, which is really the precursor and it is the whole foundation of inclusion, in inclusive education. So what do you suggest we do <laughs> to dismantle this process that we are up against in every single institution in this country and even more so in the United States? Yeah. So. Well, and I don't know about you in New Brunswick, but in Nova Scotia, but we continue to look, you know, our Department of Education continues to look to the U.S. for educational policy, and I think, and there are increasing, I'm finding, um, increasing segregation aimed against. Yeah. Um, and we reframe it, right, under what's best for these students, because this is the best thing, this is the best way and the best place to learn. How do I say, oh my gosh, that's a huge question. Um, <laughs> You know, I do think one thing that's been helpful in our faculty is that we have this, these disability studies courses, but we don't have them at the undergraduate level, and students are starting to say to us, we're not talking about, the, the problem is, we talked about this at dinner, and the problem is, we seem to be able to conceive of inclusive education um, and the importance of thinking about inclusive education in terms of social difference, right, and the importance of, of, of how we acknowledge and support um, and um, and teach from that standpoint uh, when it has everything to do with everything except disability. And we cannot get our heads around disability as a category of difference, as a category of diversity. We don't talk about disability under the diversity umbrella. Um, and I just had to get vocal broadly around campus. I'm just always the troublemaker. <laughs> I mean, we do, we have to be troublemakers. Um, and I think that the more of us who can speak to this um, from a first voice perspective, uh, but there's, it's clear we have to have the academic credentials too. That's really what gives us the credibility to say anything. It's not why I did a PhD, but it helps. Um, and I think we have to be encouraging course development that brings this into our teacher education. Right. I, I find that students, it doesn't matter where students are, mm -hmm. at the undergraduate level or the postgraduate level, mm -hmm. if, if they have no grounding 
in a philosophical perspective of inclusion yeah. or human rights discourse or rights-based agendas, yeah. there is no understanding of how it is that that foundation has to be met first. Yeah. And there's a lot of um, demand, let's put it this way, demand for cookie cutter kind of process by oh, yeah. students in these universities. Yeah, and I often, one of my first lines to my graduate students usually is if you come to this class to find out the techniques to teach those kids, you're in the wrong place. Right. Because that's not what you're going to get. But what, I, what, what we do talk about is that when you learn to think about disability very differently, it will fundamentally change your practice. There's no question it will change your practice. But I'm not giving you the cookie cutter answer because it's too easy. You know, and there are there's some good writing in and around that. And then we talk about different ways to be a, a good disability studies informed inclusive educator. The problem is we really still are going about we're calling it inclusive education, right? Around disability, but we're really still adhering to special education law. Absolutely. Because we're so totally um, and and because of that adherence, yeah. it, it is a dichotomy that anyone that is trying to advance critical disability theory within these faculties of education yeah. is up against every single day. Yeah. And there's backlash because of the student practicums, what they're exposed to and expected to deal with in schools. Yeah. So it is it is a huge I mean, we're talking a kind of a big challenge let's put it that no, way it, that i don't know if we're going to be able to address it i figure we're never going to eradicate it but i'm going to go to my grave trying <laughs> right. i think i think we're having the same frustrations and some days we just you know i'm starting to get uh, i'm getting better at saying i'm not going to debate people's human rights they're not debatable right. we're not it's good. we're not debating this and and something else that you mentioned when you were talking when you were talking about this neoliberal kind of ideology the backlash that's around that and that, mm -hmm. that um you know the whole alt-right movement and what is happening on university campuses and in communities mm -hmm. to kind of allow people to have some kind of brazen agenda and platforms yeah. to promote racist ideologies yeah. ableist ideologies yeah. sexist ideologies these things are all these are things are all like coming to the forefront now and, and they're all intertwined yeah and it, it it is actually making it really more difficult for us because Sorry, i don't so, want to i want to don't want to be the professor of bad news like you've talked about well, um, it, it, it is just very disturbing no, it, 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 it is a backlash and then i get up every day and think okay i'm gonna start this again <laughs> but, i mean i do see, i do see movement and Ursa, hi, I'm my name's Christy. Um, the thing is, I, from the university perspective, okay, you're, you're feeling your pain there, but uh, what, what you spoke, Cynthia, about, aha, uh -huh, we did identify from prof some uh, professors, and there, you know, we could look at what they were doing, and yeah. that's the good news, and it, it's not yeah. non-existent. Oh, no, I don't. And, I think it exists. I know it exists. Uh, I, I worked out with APSI, Cynthia. Yep. And one of the benefits is that as a supervisor, I get to go into many schools and many classrooms. Right. And, yeah, there's some bad news out there, but there there is some good news, and, and you're absolutely right about there's no cookie cutter. But I would say... You know, scrap the cookie cutter for a lot of things. We need the depth, and when with the depth comes really listening and empathizing with another person's experience. Yeah. That's where you get learning happening. Whether it's a kindergarten classroom, you know, five-year-olds that you're you're working with, or high school students or university students, it's when there's depth to learning, yeah. then it's transformative. And we do have some good happening, so I... Well, and sometimes we can do some little things that... So some of the things that I know on our campus that... Um, I don't know how the process works here, but, you know, they all, it seems like you used to have to get the letter, the accommodation letter, and um, take it around to professors and have them sign it, mm -hmm. right? That was, was, was what was perpetuating the myth that this was about permission. Mm -hmm. And so that form was changed, and they started to make it very clear to faculty, no, no, this is not about permission. They're not asking you permission. Right. This is about information, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. 
And so this is not about something that we're saying that you can pick and choose, because this is a, this is a right. Um, and so that has, you know, that has happened. But I, and then I did, um, I did point out that I got an accommodation letter as a faculty member, but I often don't get them because I often have mostly graduate students and I find the graduate students are tired of the system. So they just don't, you know, and so they just work for me. But I did get one that, that said these are the approved accommodations. And if students want anything else, and then the way it was framed was come back to us at Disability Services for approval. And I, so I just kind of went and I said, no, I'm not coming back to you, <laughs> right? If I think it makes sense as an educator, I'm going to do it. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to, because it's again, it's not about permission from my standpoint. You know, and I learned a lot of really good, I got actually a lot of really good language from some of my math. Um, some faculty members who were math and stats and physics and biology who just said very plainly, if I give you an hour to do a test that you need an hour and a half to do, then my measurement's flawed. End of story. And I love that I can quote math professors on that, right? Because like it or not, it gives it credibility. Yeah. All I'm doing is measuring how much you can get down on paper in an hour. It's not an accurate measurement. Not a valid measurement. Oh, hi, I'm Ramona. Hi. And I'm from Barbados. Welcome uh, to the call. Yeah, I'm, I'm enjoying it. <laughs> <laughs> I want to say that um, your lecture was quite interesting. Thank you. Um, I like how um, your research was birthed from your own experiences, and I can hear the passion. Yeah. You know about you know about disabilities and, and what you're doing to get people to understand you know what persons who are disabled go through. Now, some, some things start to go off in my mind when you start to yeah. talk about the literature and um, how faculty, you know, sometimes could be the problem or many times could be the problem in terms of accepting and including and so on. Yes. From my own experience in Barbados, I remember when I was quite young, um, there was a move, there was a shift from using the term disabled mm -hmm. to using the term differently able. <laughs> right. So right. we stop looking at people as disabled right. and looking at them as having various and different abilities, you know, and they can reach the same, you know, normal, what you would call normal inverted commas right. levels, you know, and, and achievements that other normal inverted commas right. people could um, achieve. Now I want to know what are some of the things that you could do or your faculty could do or you know, some organization could do to sensitize the faculty to the fact that the students are not necessarily disabled, they're just differently able because it it can it, it has to go a lot with conception and conceptualization. Right. How you see it. What was very interesting to me was when you said, you know, when you spoke to the lecturer and you told them, well, maybe you can accommodate me here. They said, but you have you have to be fair to all. <laughs> you know, so we can't that was the irony in that. So it shows me there and then that it may be the way that disability is conceptualized. So what are some of the things you think that you can do to help faculty to see that it's not just disability, it's yeah. something more? Well, I think, there, I think there are a lot of things that we can do, and I think we have been doing faculty education. I would say that we actually, we, we actually um, in my department, or certainly in my discipline, disability studies, we actually would not tend toward the differently abled language. Um, that would highlight normalcy and center normalcy as desirable, and it's not what we're after. So we actually deliberately use the language of disabled for a couple of reasons. Um, within the social model of disability, we would say disabled people to, to actively indicate that we are disabled by inequitable social and economic and educational arrangements. So we have impairments, but we are disabled by a fundamentally inaccessible society. And it, so that's a, a key activist term. Yes. But within cultural disability studies, we, we, it's about reclaiming that language and saying it's a legitimate, valuable, valued way of learning and being and doing. Um, and so I actually find that when I talk to faculty in those terms, rather than trying to equate our students to normal students and say they can do the same things everybody else can do, um, I actually find I have more success when I have those other conversations. 
I'm not I'm not going to change everybody's mind. I just want to learn that. And so um, sometimes you make inroads where you can make inroads. And, and um, like I said, by doing this research, I really learned um, there are faculty doing innovative things and who want to do more innovative things. So I, I think we need to look for ways to promote the student faculty relationships a little more actively um, rather than making the whole process so transactional. Yeah. And I guess that's hard when you've learned classes, but you know, I think I also think we can think creatively about how we do that. That that said, we have one, one, um, I'm I'm interested, my area is instructional design, is that one And um, one of the, the things that uh, has become more and more popular, I'll say, at, at this university and no other universities is uh, instructional, universal instructional yeah. design or yeah. UDL. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm just wondering, I think I, I think I know what your take on it's going to be, but I'd be interested to hear. I think it's a tool, yeah. but I think it's being marketed as the solution. Exactly. Yeah. And exactly. I think that's a problem. Yeah. I think there are a lot of really good ways to be um, solid, inclusive educator, and UBL is one of them. Constructivist pedagogies are one way of doing it, right? I mean, there are a lot of ways. And again, I think just listening to students, particularly the post-secondary level, you can learn a lot from mm -hmm. students and listening to students um, and what they bring to the conversation and then what your conversations and reciprocal sorts of relationships with them can generate around how we can do the rules differently because we don't always have the answers. Clearly, if we haven't been in these circumstances before, but if we're both open. Um, you know, I, I honestly waited till my doctor until I got that from a faculty member. That's a long wait. Until I had a faculty member who was with me 100% of the time. Um, and, and had really and listened, but then had really good uh, things to offer me. So I think I think UDL um, is it's fine. I, of course, it's a good way to. Of course, we want to always be planning pedagogically for the you know most diverse classroom. We want to plan for everybody's presence in the classroom. There's no question, and that's a great strategy. But it's a strategy. It is not the be all and the end all. It's not the only answer. And I'm, I'm fearful that that's where we're going. I am too. That we think that that's the answer because we want answers, which is one thing I actually tell my graduate students, you want quick answers. And this is, you, you have just removed yourself from the equation because you want to be able to go to work and write an answer. I want you to think, and I want you to think with disability rather than about how you solve that pesky problem mm -hmm. in your classroom. Well, I think that's a good, good point to end. So, just another thank you very much. So, we do have a uh, reception down in room 255. Please join us to continue these conversations. I think there'll be a lot of great, useful conversations. We do have a little gift for you, which is the, the poster on the uh, for you. So, thanks very much. I think there are is happy still here. I don't see. Is there? There's food. And yes. Down yeah. There. There's food so there's there. fruit and coffee and bread. Sweet bread. Great. Awesome. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Drink okay. some water. Enjoy yeah. some snacks. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I turn it off.